Well, welcome. In this video, we're going to look at the energy and where we get the energy for muscle contraction. And we're going to look at a real amazing uh, type of a molecule called ATP. So ATP is our body's energy. Again, we talked about this in one of the earlier chapters. ATP is basically the, uh, the, the gas of the body. It is the energy of the body. Um, first source of energy of muscle contraction, muscle cells store only a small amount of it. We're going to see this. They also have a chemical called creatine phosphate. And if you're someone who goes to the gym pretty regularly, you might have heard this. Creatine phosphate is a type of an enzyme that is going to be stored inside our muscles that allow for the conversion of ADP and phosphate into ATP. It is there for short burst energy. Again, about 10 or so seconds of muscle contraction that is added to what normally is. And we'll talk about this in a minute. But when I have to do something longer than this, I will get into what we call cellular respiration. We've already looked at this, the three-stage process of breaking down glucose and turning glucose into ATP. So those are the three parts, small amount of ATP in reserve, creatine phosphate for burst energy, cellular respiration for prolonged energy. Um, again, you cannot stop moving. Everything in your body is moving. So we keep ATP in storage for just those minor things that are always going on. Your body is going to monitor your average uh, energy output, whether you're someone who's walking all the time or carrying things or, you know, you're very active, your resting energy is different from someone who is, even if you're a student and you're just studying and you're not doing a lot of activity as far as muscular activity, um, you're not using a lot of, of that. So your body is monitoring your normal second by second energy expenditure and it's going to keep ATP in reserves for just keeping that normal. Then we're going to keep creatine phosphate in reserve for burst energy. Like let's say uh, you hear something and I've run out of the room to go check and see what it is. That's not normal. That's what we call burst energy. So about 10 to 15 seconds of that, our body has creatine phosphate for doing it. Now, again, if you don't do that at all, if you're very sedentary, your body's going to start taking creatine phosphate away because everything functions on a use it or lose it basis. But once we get past this short burst energy, then we get into this cellular respiration, the breakdown of glucose, the three stage process that happens in two phases, anaerobic and aerobic, glycolysis, citric or Krebs cycle, citric acid cycle or Krebs cycle, and then the electron transport chain. So this is kind of the idea of what's going on when uh, we have the creatine phosphate to help uh, create ATP. Now, in cellular respiration, like I said, we've got two phases, anaerobic, which means without oxygen. So this is a little oxygen molecule, and I'll say, no, 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 I don't need oxygen. What happens is glucose, I'll just put a big G here. That's supposed to be a G. Ooh, looks like an arrow. But if this is a cell, glucose enters the cell, and it's going to be broken in half. This is called glycolysis. It literally means glycolysis. Lysis means to break down, break down glucose. Right? It happens in the cytoplasm. It does not have to have oxygen present. It's only going to produce two ATP or very little, as it would just be said. Um, this automatically happens. Now, if in the breakdown of here, I have oxygen present, I can take these two parts and put them into the mitochondria. Because it requires oxygen to do that, this is called the aerobic phase. The aerobic phase has to have oxygen. Without oxygen, I cannot get into this thing called, well, that looks like it's something screaming. It looks like it's teeth here. Woo. I cannot get into this really amazing structure called the mitochondria. But as long as I got oxygen present, as long as oxygen is present, as I have it, that sounded bad English, but anyway, now I can get this, this breakdown of glucose into the mitochondria and I'll go through the two stages citric acid cycle, or sometimes called the Krebs cycle, and the electron transport chain. 
those two things happen inside the mitochondria. So I have three, um, I have three steps. Let me erase some of this stuff here. Three steps. I've got glycolysis. Whoop, I have citric acid whoop, and electron transport chain. But I have two phases. Right? The first phase doesn't require oxygen because it's called anaerobic. It is glycolysis, the breakdown of glucose. It happens in the cytoplasm. If oxygen is present, then I can get into the mitochondria. This is what we call the aerobic phase because it needs oxygen. In the mitochondria, there's going to be two steps. First is the citric acid cycle, and the third, or the second step in the mitochondria, the third step overall, is called the electron transport chain. And the electron transport chain in particular is what makes a lot of ATP. It's like hitting the jackpot. Now, inside our muscles, we have a very amazing molecule called myoglobin. Now, hemoglobin is in the blood and it holds oxygen. Hopefully everybody knows that. This is the same basic molecule, only since it is inside the muscle, it is called myoglobin. Again, its job is to hold oxygen so that when I need it, it's there. Now, as you exercise, depending on your level of activity, your body will either create and have more myoglobin if you're active, or if you're not active, it'll start pulling away myoglobin and not uh, keeping it. This is why it gets, it's so hard if you haven't been active and do something active, you get sore, and it's because you don't have a lot of myoglobin. You can't use the aerobic phase. And we'll see why that in just a second. So this is a picture kind of showing it. This is a, a weird picture of a mitochondria. They drew it really big so you can see kind of how it works. But again, the electron transport chain in general is going to produce about 28 ATP, citric acid only two, and the glycolysis basically only two. Now, this is the thing that I wanted to say. If you don't have oxygen and you can't use oxygen efficiently, the breakdown of glucose, instead of ending in something, and I don't care that you know it's peruvic acid, but not knowing that it, you know, since oxygen is not present and I can no longer get into the mitochondria, the end part of uh, glycolysis is lactic acid, which is what causes your muscles to be sore. Now, one of the things is trying to figure out how when we um, when we exercise, what's going on? So if I haven't exercised for a while, I'm going to start losing myoglobin, which means I'm not going to be able to use oxygen efficiently. I'm going to have a lot of different things go on where I'm not going to have all of the material I need. So if I start exercising, what's going to happen is I'm going to push past what I normally can do, and I'm going to start producing lactic acid. My body is letting me run on what, something that we'll call basically oxygen debt. It's saying, all right, you can use all the oxygen reserves we have, but you've got to pay me back. I'm going to allow you to push past your normal limit. In doing so, we start creating lactic acid. Now, as this happens, lactic acid is going to start, it's an acid. Muscles are mainly protein. Acids denature protein, so they will start hurting the skeletal muscle fibers. They act in myosin. Now, when this happens, it's sore, but my body's going to start rebuilding them, and it makes it into a better, more elaborate part. So even though I'm out of shape and I go to the gym and I'm sore, I have to start working through that soreness. In the soreness, in the breaking down of my muscles through the lactic acid, I'm going to rebuild them better. But this oxygen debt is why, again, let's say I'm out of shape. If I go to the gym and I start exercising, I'm going to get out of breath very quickly. That is because I don't have much oxygen in reserve. So this oxygen debt, I get past my point of payment, basically, and my body will cause me to stop. And I start breathing deeply, and that is repaying this oxygen debt. All right. So I hope that makes sense. Now, when we get into the oxygen debt, that means we're producing lactic acid. The lactic acid is going to be pulled out of our uh, muscles gradually, all right, and it will go to the liver, and the liver cells will convert the lactic acid back into glucose. 
um, and that's a really important thing. Now, there is only one other area that can do this, and it is the heart. And it's really kind of cool if you think about it, because if I'm producing lactic acid, that means I'm pushing and exercising uh, past my point of comfort. Now, I cannot do anything active that does not affect the heart. So the heart is the muscle that is always working. So if I'm looking at it, what it's telling me is the muscle, if I am working to the point of I'm hurting, I'm going to take the garbage of being out of shape. The heart is the only area besides the liver that can take the garbage of being out of shape and turn it back into energy. And I think that's pretty cool. So this is kind of just the cycle as it's talking about oxygen debt. Glycogen, remember glycogen is what we store glucose as. Uh, in general, muscles do uh, store it, but the liver is the main one. So the liver is going to have this glycogen. It's going to push when I need it. It's going to break it down into glucose and push it out to the body. When I have extra glucose, I'm going to pull it back into the liver and store it as glycogen. This glucose is going to go through the cycle of you know, turning it back and forth, and this is showing that I'm not using my oxygen efficiently. The pruvic acid, if I was, it would go into the mitochondria, into the two steps of aerobic respiration. But this is showing the path that it's not going through. Now, muscle fatigue, again, the inability of a muscle, to, uh, inability to contract a muscle, um, it amazes me that they put this on here. Some of the things for muscle fatigue. Now, one, in one of the earlier videos here, we talked about compartment syndromes, swelling inside a little uh, contained area of muscles. What that does is it constricts uh, the, the blood vessels and it, and it stops a lot of the blood getting into the area. So it gets decreased blood flow. If you go to the gym and work out, if you look at the mirror, you will see that you're swollen, basically, because your blood is pumping to those muscles. That's why you see the people, and they'll flex in front of the mirrors trying to show off their big guns or whatever. Um, but it's at that point in time, they're going to be swollen. Now, that swelling also puts a pressure on the blood flow that's getting to it, so I can't get a lot of blood flow to it. So this will cause muscle fatigue. Again, it's kind of a, a little bit of a safety valve, so I don't overexercise. Also, if I keep doing it, I'm going to have problems with the ion balances. I can have a problem with sodium and potassium, how it's being moved back and forth, and the muscles will have a hard time contracting because of that. Again, fail safe. Now, I'm going to skip to the bottom one here, and I don't know why it says controversial, but as lactic acid um, accumulates, we're going to start having more and more damage to the muscle fibers, again, it's an acid, and muscles are proteins. Acids denature proteins, so it's going to have some problems with that. And so as the lactic acid continues to accumulate, my body is going to have this, this, this warning mechanism and say, you can't exercise anymore. I don't know if anybody here has gotten to the point where you've pushed, your, pushed yourself to a point where you can't move. Um, I have, I, I, I'm not going to say I'm a big gym person, but there are times I, I was really active in, in, in sports, and there were times I worked out where, uh, I don't know if there, anybody really knows this, but there were times when cars did not have power steering. I don't know if anybody's ever tried to drive a car that doesn't have power steering, uh, but if it's not moving, it's very tough. So I had a stick shift without power steering, and there were times when I would sit in the car after I went to uh, exercise that I couldn't drive because my arms were like jello. They refused. Now, this one right here, and I'm going to put it in yellow here. This law, well, I'm not going to do yellow because it doesn't show up. Let's do blue. This loss of desire to continue to exercise. This is not muscle fatigue. I have no idea who put this here, but that is not muscle fatigue. That is brain fatigue. There are plenty of people who sit on their couch and so and say, I don't have a desire to exercise. That is not muscle fatigue. Uh, I think that somebody slipped that past the, the editors, but um, loss, of con loss of desire to continue to exercise is not muscle fatigue. That's brain fatigue, basically. Now, muscle cramps, we don't get into muscle cramps that much here. All a muscle cramp is, by definition, is a sustained involuntary muscle contraction. It can happen multiple different ways. Ion imbalances, hormone issues, 
all kinds of different reasons for muscles to contract and different types. But just know our cramp. Just know that a cramp is a sustained involuntary muscle contraction. In a little bit, we will see the, the scientific name. Most everybody know what a tetanus shot is. You might not know that a tetanus shot is designed to help you from getting um, infected with a bacteria that's going to cause a muscle cramp to mainly your masseter. We call it lockjaw. So um, tetanus or tetanic is going to be a muscle contraction that's a muscle cramp, an uncontrolled, sustained, involuntary muscle contraction. And again, it can be caused by multiple different things. Now, one of the big things about muscle contractions, this is the last slide we look at, but it is muscle contraction is designed to help heat and control our temperature. Uh, heat is a byproduct of cellular respirations in active cells. Uh, muscle cells are the major source of body heat. Uh, when uh, your muscles are stimulated to contract and any contraction over 50%, uh, as it says here, more than half of the energy is released as heat and so this helps warm our body this is one of the reasons if you have like the flu and you you ache when you have something that has a uh, you have your temperature raised really quickly the muscles deep in your back and in your thighs are the ones that are going to be contracting and relaxing and you're not even really going to know it but those are going to be the ones that are driving up your body temperature and that's why it feels like you know, you, you're, you ache so much, like you exercise, because in a way you had. All right. Well, I hope, again, all of this makes sense, um, and we will continue on. I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Have a wonderful day.